It's so great to see all of you here. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, first of all, of course, thank you to the Stalic Museum for hosting us today, uh, Studium Generale, Rietveld Academy, Jurinde Seidel, Jort van der Laan, uh, Nikos Dulos, the amazing Nikos, um, and Jorun and Michael and all the team for helping us with the tech. Uh, and all, to all the wonderful participants of the day, thank you for coming and being with us here. Okay, so I think I'm going to need my glasses. All right. um, in the spirit of last year's conference on touch, in kinship and ongoing conversation, my hope is that we approach this day together as a day of study, a thinking together, that allows for collective bewilderment, chance meetings, experiment, and improvisation. In his opening remarks to the day he curated at last year's symposium, Jack Halberstam spoke of bewilderment and wildness, the relationship between the word wild and the word bewilderment, the importance of getting lost and not being found. Our day-to-day -day excess swarm, wild in the wild, seeks to tease out the ways in which confounding, collective, and wayward encounters and practices are material to our surviving and flourishing in a wild west. It wants to move and vibrate in and out of and with swarms of resonance, sounds of the reverb. In acoustics, resonance is the prolongation of sound by reverberation, from Latin resonantia echo, from resonare to sound again, to resound. In physics, resonance is when one object vibrates at the same frequency of another object, propelling that second object into vibrational motion, resonance as relays in tandem. The reverb is created when sound waves from any sound source reflect off other surfaces in space, causing a plurality of reflections. In these opening remarks, I would like to think resonance and reverberation as the interacting emergences of critical fabulation. In other words, if to fabulate is to come up with, to invent, how are these practices of dreaming up always inherently materialized through quotidian meetings and encounters forming what Laura Harris calls aesthetic sociality? How can we sense resonance as the condition of possibility of critical fabulation? In turn, how is critical fabulation always about a being with a, a resounding of encountering frequencies? Furthermore, how are these resonances and reverberations bound up with what Amber Jamila Musser terms excess forms of embodiment, where, quote, history's woundedness allow us to imagine an inhabitation that exists in excess of them. Musser calls for epistemologies of fleshiness, arguing that theory emerges from flesh pointing to the ways fleshly activity rescript what counts as knowledge. In and through the body and its constant movements, this rescripting refuses knowledge as fixity and transparency. Excess flesh troubles visual truths and is often opaque and incoherent to linguistic explication and definition. Moving within the realms of the sensation and the sensual, where the sensual is the space of non-reproductive excess and aesthetic expressivity, Musa reminds us of how racialized bodies relegated to flesh are historically and ongoingly produced in encounters with white supremacy. She points to the radical potential of excess without flattening the violence at its core. Musser states, quote, Excess disrupts already articulated forms of thought by revealing what violence produces but cannot incorporate." End quote. These disordering sensual excesses resonate with Gayatri Gopinath's study of the aesthetic practices and unruly visions of queer diaspora. 
Gopinath reminds us that an abiding legacy of colonial modernity is its institution of a way of seeing. Exceeding governing visual fields, the aesthetic practices of queer diaspora undo measured space and time, displacing dominant rubrics of knowing, locating, and mapping. Through queer regional imaginaries and their encounters and collisions, trans-temporal relays of effective relationality are unleashed between aesthetic practices that may seem discontinuous and unrelated. Co-implications and radical relationalities between disparate racial formations, geographies, temporalities, and colonial and post-colonial histories of displacement and dwelling trace lines of connection and vibration in a kind of south-south relationality across indigenous and diasporic regional spaces that bypass the nation. How are the aesthetic practices, in other words, the aesthetic enactments of queer diaspora, performances of disorientation and suspension that are disruptive and productive in their energy and excess? Gopinath asks, how is this also always a question of the possibilities for the alternative organizing of social relations? The queer optics of the aesthetic practices of queer diaspora swarm alongside and through Wando Ibizi's distorted constellations. Ibizi's is a neurophenological approach to the creation of a ritual space and ritual actions. Housing a living, breathing, symbolic representation of the artist's inner and outer states, the actions and reflections in her piece, Distorted Constellations, are animated by a mythopoetic reimagining of neural pathways relating to specific emotional states selected for a neurodivergent ritual. Inspired by research with neuroscientists, psychiatrists, and Afro-diasporic ritual practitioners, Ibiza's distorted constellations are immersive, fragmented, and multisensory. By way of the neurodivergent experience of the unruly visions and excesses of her own visual snow, Ibizi embodies and expresses the shattering of visualized time and space, where diasporic ritual dance and movement commingle with futuristic technologies in the magical real realism of science. Offering us a provocative theory of the split aesthetic in anti-colonial time, Sandra Ruiz also explores the meeting point of the psychic and the social within aesthetic life. Addressing the colonization of time and our normative assumptions of negation and incompletion within minoritarian performance art, Ruiz is interested in how brown and queer artists translate fragmentation into futural subjectivities. Her talk will move from the aesthetic to the political to show how the artists she studies with provide an escape hatch from linear time. Or in her own words, how do we account for the unconscious properties of our flesh and the conscious claims of our bodily endurance practices when the parts are always already whole, even if here and not yet there? How might the split aesthetic supply a relational way to dream and construct alternative forms of existence under unsovereign oppression. Malak Helmi's and Janine Armin's ambient poetics, their frequencies, remixing, morphing, grafting, work through a splitting technology that is in between, like a trickster, always giving the slip. In Helmi's words, quote, Trickster is nothing and all. Trickster cannot be caught. Trickster is animal as animal in his idea of animal. Trickster morphs like a dream in your brain and outside of it." End quote. Helmi's and Armin's collaborative and improvised ambient poetics and love songs are attempts to graft with a technology which is beyond identification. Quote, and this is Malak again, we are in our skin, but extend beyond it in a way we cannot name, into the kind of knowledge of the swarm of starlings that is more than the sum of its parts." End quote. Helmi and Armin will fabulate a story that tells of the avatar of apathy of cat dogs. <laughs> 
In her multimedia performance, Jackie Wang's attempted aberrations in the domain of emergence is an attempt to shatter the avatar of the avatar before it eats the girl alive. Wang's sounds, her ambient poetics, will move through the space as it moves through her book, Carceral Capitalism. In the epigraph of this book, Wang cites Achille Bembe's words, quote, racial capitalism is the equivalent of a giant necropolis. It rests on the traffic of the dead and human bones, end quote. In the final chapter of this book titled The Prison Abolitionist Imagination, A Conversation, Wang seeks to show how the prison itself is a problem for thought that can only be unthought using a mode of thinking that does not capitulate to the realism of the present. She asks, can the re-enchantment of the world be an instrument that we use to shatter the realism of the prison? In this chapter, Wang is in conversation with many poets, dead and alive, all having been imprisoned, and cites the black arts movement poet and activist Sonia Sanchez. Quote, without your residential breath, I lose my timing, end quote. Her experience of hearing this haiku leads Wang to write of how our bodies are not closed loops, we synchronize our tempos to find a rhythm through which the urge to live is expressed collectively. In this way, we set the world in motion where poets can become the timekeepers of revolution. The Invisible Committee write that revolutionary movements do not spread by contamination, but by resonance. Today's narrative emulates the errant path of the wayward and moves from one story to another by way of encounter, chance meeting, proximity, and the sociality created by enclosure. It strives to convey the aspiration and longing of the wayward and the tumult and upheaval incited by the chorus. The narrative emulates the errant path of the wayward and moves from one story to another by way of encounter, chance meeting, proximity, and the sociality created by enclosure. It strives to convey the aspiration and longing of the wayward and the tumult and upheaval incited by the chorus. This quote is from Sadia Hartman's essay, The Anarchy of Colored Girls Assembled in a Riotous Manner. Hartman delves deep into historical and photographic archives and case files and writes a speculative history of the everyday, ungovernable, wayward lives of black girls' social life in the beginnings of the 20th century in North American cities such as New York. Social life resistant and prior to power, rebellious, refusing domestication and social morality, always criminalized and policed, incarcerated even for future crimes. Her new book, The Critical Fabulation, titled Wayward Lives, Beautiful Experiments, closes with an image of a murmuration, a swarm of starlings, leaving us in a state of resounding resonance and bewilderment. For resonance is also a word for the transmission of feeling, thought, memory, Jose Esteban Munoz writes of the transmission of brownness that forms a brown commons unknowable in advance. As a concept, even a, a method, it represents a, quote, swarm of singularities. In the essay, Vitalism's Afterburn, a sense of Ana Mendieta, uh, Munoz writes, quote, these brown feelings are not the sole province of people who have been called or call themselves brown. It is instead, and more importantly, the sharing out of a brown sense of the world, end quote. And from uh, the sense of brown, a small preface that was recently published in GLQ, um, uh, he continues, the brown commons is not about the production of the individual, but instead a movement, a flow, the swerve of the encounter. Brownness, 
the shared historical experience of dispossession, the sharing out of the unshareable, invaluable, incalculable, a brown sense of the world where a minoritarian shared <clears throat> recognition of being a problem is not an impasse, but an opening to belonging otherwise and elsewhere. And yet, resonance does not make for an easy and simplistic gathering of a symposium of the whole. For resonance is always also a discrepant engagement. Its movements and relays through time and space are simultaneously integrative and disintegrative. We could think of study as swarm, we could think of school as swarm, our commons as constantly reform reformational but also deformational formless formation. Fisher, fracture, incongruity, the rickety, the creaking of the word, these practices inhabit discrepancy, as Nathaniel Mackey writes. Discrepant engagements are necessary, for they reveal and sound out the ways in which, quote, creative kinship and the lines of affinity it affects are much more complex, jagged, and indissociable than the totalizing pretensions of canon formation tend to acknowledge, end quote. Discrepant engagement, rather than suppressing or seeking to silence noise, acknowledges it. It is the anti-foundational acknowledgement of founding noise. Today, let us vibrate with sensual excess, the split aesthetic in anti-colonial time, poetic aberrations, distorted constellations, unruly visions, trickster avatars, dancing hammers, noise and shatter, a chorus. Monso Manso inaugurates our day with a dance entitled Brown Handbag. They are a dancer and choreographer, and their piece Brown Handbag was premiered last week at the Queer Bengali Night at the Bethnal Green Working Men's Club in London. Carrying a hammer in a handbag and safety clothes as armor, theirs is a meditation, a ritual for self-defense, and a brown trans fantasy where purposeless dances persist, smolder, and live. <laughs> 